Hey everyone, it's Jenny and welcome back to my channel. The story ain't over. Today's video is a pure and simple tier ranking video. So I went on Instagram the other day and I asked you all for your favorite book tropes. If you're not following me on Instagram, definitely go follow. It's at the story ain't over. Not surprisingly, a lot of you had very similar favorite book tropes, which was a lot of fun. And I think I resonated with a lot of them as well. So I'm excited to talk about those, but also talk about the ones that I don't particularly like. So I have 40 or so book tropes to go through, but before we get into that, I did want to talk about the sponsor of today's video, which is G2A. So if you didn't know, International Women's Day is on March 8th this year, and G2A is celebrating with a It's Your Turn Girls campaign. So from March 1st to March 20th at the link below, G2A will have several deals on different game keys and gift cards that are all perfect gifts for girls of any age. And they've got a whole host of games on sale, including Destiny 2, Spider-Man, Gods of War, Cyberpunk, and Minecraft. I'm definitely eyeing Cyberpunk because it's currently 59% off, so we'll see. So definitely take advantage of their deals and check out the link below and thank you to G2A for sponsoring today's video. Alrighty, let's get into the tier ranking. I have five tiers on here and they're pretty pure and simple. So we have God tier at the top. We have satisfying after that. So tropes that are just purely satisfying. I really enjoy them. Next we have neutral. I don't feel strongly about these tropes in any way, shape or form. And then we've got overdone, which is just all the tropes that I think have been floating around for too long. I've seen them too many times. I think they're overdone and they're often not done very well, so I'm over them. And then finally, we have strongly dislike this. This is basically my nice way of saying I hate these tropes. I feel like everyone has their own opinions, but there's certain tropes that just irk me to no end. And if they're in any book, it's an immediate turnoff. So that's where they are. Alrighty, so starting off strong, we have one that got away. This one is definitely a satisfying one for me. I personally really enjoy it, especially in like contemporary literary fiction with like characters who are much older or novels that span a long period of time. A few books that have this trope off the top of my head are When We Left Cuba by Chanel Clayton, Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid, and The Stationery Shop by Marjan Kamali. I will say that the one that got away can either be played in the sense of like they never get together in the end, or it's like you are trying to rekindle a romance with the one that got away, like you're seeing them again after a long time. Either way, I enjoy it, so it's definitely a satisfying trope for me. Next up, we have Forbidden Romance. This is definitely one that I think is overdone and also one that I don't really like anymore. I'm on the fence here. I think in some cases it can be good. I think in like a fantasy, this is something I might enjoy a little bit better. Like maybe they're on opposite sides of, you know, the whole situation. And so it's forbidden in that sense. That I kind of like, but I've seen it happen in like contemporary YA books, which I just, I don't even want to touch. There was that book called Forbidden, literally. And it was like, an incest book. Another one is City of Bones. I absolutely love the Mortal Instruments and like Sandra Clare books, but I do think that that first series is like one of her weaker ones. I loved it when I was younger, but I think if I reread it now and you know, had to experience the slight incest trope, I don't know that I would love it anymore. Next we have antagonist turned ally. And guys, this is God tier. I love this trope. It's something that happens in a lot of books, whether they are contemporaries, whether they are fantasy books. And I think it's satisfying every time the idea that someone who is against you or standing in your way, coming to your side and becoming an ally and becoming someone who supports you or at least begrudgingly helps you. Like, I love that. And it's also just like really fun and funny to watch, especially when it's like a begrudging ally, like that, you know, anti-hero or antagonist who like really doesn't want to help the main character, but then they begrudgingly help because, you know, it serves their interests, but then they become friends and it's just like so cute. I love it every time. I don't have a specific example of this because I feel like it just happens so often, but I do really love it. And actually one variation of this trope, I think is the mean girl turned ally. This is something I love in books when the mean girl character who was like bothering the main character a lot or, you know, giving them a lot of trouble ends up being someone who turns into an ally and ends up being like this really well-rounded character who has gone through a lot of character growth. I think a really good example of this is like Zoya from the Shadow and Bone series. I do think there's aspects of her journey that aren't handled very well, but by the end of the Shadow and Bone series and when we get into King of Scars, she's such an awesome character and I love her like as a person. Next up we have aunties in fiction. So this is one that I think I put in because honestly I find it so freaking satisfying. I love books with aunties that are really supportive and 
and like will go through hell and high water to help out the main character or they're really bent on helping the main characters despite all their protests and stuff. So a couple books that do this really well are Dating Dr. Dill by Nisha Sharma and then I know a lot of people love the aunties in Dial A for Aunties by Jesse Q. Sutanto. I haven't read that one but I really want to. Next up we have Best Friend's Brother. I honestly do not care for this trope and I don't think I like it all that much either. The one example that I can think of is The Kissing Booth and I haven't even read those books but I've like seen the movies float around. I don't even think I've seen a full movie but like any clips I see of those movies I just get immediately turned off and I don't know what it is but I think the best friend's brother thing is just so awkward and I don't love the idea of it like causing friction between best friends and I also find that in some romances it ends up turning into this like love triangle thing which I despise. <laughs> okay next up we have boarding schools and this is one that I honestly don't really love all that much anymore and I think it's often overdone or it's not done super well. I do have a couple examples of ones that are good though. So one example of one that isn't done well is Of Curses and Kisses by Sandhya Menon. That book is one that I had really high hopes for but I don't think overall it was done all that well and I think the boarding school aspect was just like a very aside thing to have the characters in the same vicinity without parents but it didn't really do anything for me overall. I think I prefer the boarding school stories where the school itself plays a big part in the story, whether it's like the teachers or the school itself, the building, or like the academia aspect, whatever it is. And I think a book and series that does this really well is the Truly Devious series by Maureen Johnson. If you haven't read those, they're really great. They're like YA mysteries and they're set in a boarding school and they're so freaking good because their boarding school aspect just plays such a strong part in the book and it feels like a character and there's so much mystery behind it and history behind it that makes it so fun. So I think if this is done well, I enjoy it, but I feel like it's often not done well or it's just like added there for like a side flavor. I also feel like I've seen this done in a lot of TV shows. Like it's just a means to get characters in the same vicinity without parents and without like supervision, which is like fine, but it's not like a trope that I love, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Alrighty, next up we have Celebrity Romance, and this is one that I definitely think I strongly dislike. I recently read Funny You Should Ask by Alyssa Sussman, and this is a book that supremely secured the idea in my head that I do not like celebrity romances. And I think I particularly do not like celebrity romances where it's like a celebrity and then a regular person. I think I might enjoy a celebrity romance if it's like two celebrities who fall in love. I think that makes more sense to me. They have more to connect with and they're both already in like the public eye so it makes sense. But the ones where one person is not famous, it just makes zero sense to me. And I often find that the main character who isn't a celebrity is like objectifying the celebrity at the beginning before they get to know them. And I don't know, I just don't love celebrity culture and this idea of objectifying people or thinking they are so much better than you just because they're a celebrity, I guess. Like, yes, they're accomplished people, whatever it is, but like, they are not God walking on earth. So that's kind of how I feel. Alrighty, next up we have the book trope that is probably the most famous one out there. The one that everyone says is their favorite book trope. And I'm sorry, guys, but... This one is going in overdone for me. And let me explain before you come for me. Basically, what I feel about enemies to lovers is that it is often overdone in a lot of like contemporary romances as like, oh, they're enemies at work or oh, they did this and so they're enemies. But it's very artificially crafted, like the beginning of their relationship. It's like insult, ridiculous banter at the beginning for no apparent reason and then they quickly clear up a stupid misunderstanding and then they're friends or like somewhat friends and then they turn into lovers. It doesn't really do anything for me. I think it's overdone. I think it's just put there for flavor for the sake of it, but it doesn't really do much. But on the flip side, I do actually like enemies to lovers in fantasy books and sci-fi books where the stakes are much higher and they actually are enemies, like they're on the opposite sides of things or they're like actively working against each other or one is actually the villain and then, you know, they turn to the good side. One really great example of this, and it's not a book, I'm sorry, but it's Katara and Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender. They are the epitome of enemies to lovers for me, even though they don't even get to like the lovers part. Their relationship is one that is like so poised to be an enemy to lovers because they extremely hate each other. They are on opposite sides, but Zuko has such character growth that brings him to the good side and you could see it potentially happening. But obviously the show is what it is and that doesn't happen, but I 
love the construction of their relationship in the show. So in cases like that, in like fantasy sci-fi where you can actually believe that they're enemies and then one of them has some really great character growth that brings them to the good side and then they fall in love, like that works for me. But otherwise, I'm sorry, but it feels overdone. Alrighty, next up we have another really popular trope and that is fake dating and the enemies to lovers people are gonna come for me, but this is actually one of my favorite tropes and it's satisfying almost every time. I do think it is a bit overdone. So in a different world, if I didn't enjoy this as much, I would probably put it under overdone or done too often. But personally for me, most books where I've read a fake dating relationship, I enjoy it every time. A couple examples are Take a Hint Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. Love that book so much. I also really enjoyed The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood. I know a lot of people don't love this one. I'm of the group of people who really enjoyed it and I found the fake dating thing worked for me even if there were like really cringy parts to the book. I've also seen fake dating done really well in some YA romances. So a couple of my favorites are Frankly in Love by David Yoon and in that one the main characters fake date because their parents want them to find someone from like the same background and um, culture as them. So the main character in the book is Korean and then the girl he fake dates is also Korean and they're trying to like appease their parents but then they end up like falling for each other. Love that. It's like a very real situation that could happen as well as someone who comes from a brown family who is very much about like keeping up with the culture. It could happen and I love it. Another one I really love is Honey and His Shoes Guide to Fake Dating which is another YA and that one is actually queer and it's so freaking cute. It's about these two Muslim girls and one of them is I believe lesbian and then the other one is bi but her friends are not believing that she's bi and that she likes girls and so they end up in like this fake dating relationship that mutually benefits them and it's just so freaking cute and their relationship adorable. Alrighty, next up we have Found Family and this was by far the most popular book trope that you guys sent in to me. Like 50% of the responses were Found Family and I understand it. It is one of my favorite things as well and I think it's something that so many people relate to. Regardless of your own family situation, I think there's something so amazing about finding a family of people outside of your own family in a place where, you know, you thought that you would be alone. And I think it's just so freaking beautiful. And seeing it in books is just so satisfying because you see the way that these characters come together and the bond that they form. And it's just so wonderful to read about. So Found Family is definitely going in God tier for me. And there's certainly several books out there that do this so, so well. A few of my favorites are Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo, Babel by R.F. Kuang, Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor also has a really great aspect of this. And then another couple are The Gilded Wolves by Roshni Chokshi, really great found family in that one. And then also recently in Lee Bardugo's sequel to Ninth House, Hellbent, that one also has a bit of a found family aspect to it, ensemble cast aspect that just really works works and I really really enjoyed it. Next up we have one of my favorite tropes ever and I feel like this will only resonate with the small number of people who are like me who love sad tortured books where everything's like bittersweet at the end and you don't get a full resolution. So it's friends but not quite lovers but more. This is definitely god tier for me and let me explain this trope. This is basically that situation where you have characters who are such good friends, best friends, whatever it is, and they have this bond that is like so much more than being friends. And you can sense that there's like some sort of romantic aspect to their relationship or they want it to be, but they can't like get it to that point. And it's also like something that would ruin the purity of that like friendship, I guess. The book that I think does this really well is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. I love this book so much. And the main reason is because of the relationship between the main characters in the book. It is a book that shows a friendship over 30 years as they make games together. And it is such a beautiful book. And the relationship between the main characters is just so wondrous and I, I, I don't know how to put into words what about it gets me, but it gets me every time. Like it's this idea that even beyond romantic relationship, there's someone who can understand you and see into your soul so deeply and like they're basically your soulmate. And so like the romantic and physical aspects of love don't even matter because this love for you and your love for them is beyond all of that, beyond expression. And it's so freaking beautiful. All right, the next trope we have is Girl Boss x Himbo. And honestly, this one does not do anything for me. I 
feel like this is one that I don't really like. I think personally for me as like my preference, I enjoy love interests who are smart. <laughs> I do love the idea of like a himbo, that's totally fine, but I think like I find intelligence very attractive and I find capability and resourcefulness really attractive versus physical appearance. So yeah, I do like this dynamic though because it's like a flip on what's traditionally been done to women. So I don't wanna discredit that, but I do think it's not personally one of my favorites. Next up we have Grumpy X Sunshine. This is one that I personally think is very satisfying for me. I, for the most part, really enjoy this one in basically any genre and I think it's a dynamic that happens with a lot of couples and like a lot of relationships. There's always that person who is more extroverted, more sunshiny, more happy with the whole world and life. And then they somehow always end up in a relationship with like the dark cloud of a person who's like always grumpy and needs everything a specific way. And I just love the dynamic between that. It's so cute. Next up I have Hate Everyone But You. This is one that I think, I don't know that I love all that much and I wanna explain this. I feel like when I was younger, I kind of like this, this idea that the love interest hates everyone, is so done with everyone, but really cares for you and puts all this attention for you. And I think that's like something that's like very, you know, exciting. But I think now that I'm older and recognizing just how people are. I don't really like this anymore because it often happens with like the male love interest who is like the arrogant asshole who is rude and mean to literally everyone, but they are so nice to the love interest, the main girl. And I think it just like gives too much leeway for this character to just be like an awful person to literally everyone. On the flip side though, I do think that this can be done in the way of someone who is socially awkward or antisocial and they don't really like hanging out with people, but they like hanging out with the love interest or like the person that they care for. And like that I'm totally fine with, but this idea of like they actually hate and treat people badly, don't like that. Alrighty, next up we have Fated to Be Together Romance, and this one, I don't know. I really, really love this one, and I often find it really satisfying for me, but I do think it's one that can be not done very well a lot of times. But actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I have seen this in some fantasy books, <coughs> Sarah J Mass, and I don't really love it, so maybe not. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe not. I don't like it in those situations where it's like the mate thing, that really bothers me. But I do like the idea of fated to be together when it's like characters who in another life, they were meant to be together, and then they're finally getting that chance to be together in this life. I love that, like the reincarnation thing, but I actually haven't seen that done very, very often. I think I don't like it when one character out of the two feels entitled to the person because they're fated to be together. I think that's where I don't like it. Alrighty, next up we have Epilogue Pregnancy, and this is one that I threw in, not that anyone said that they love this, but I just wanted to talk about this because I absolutely despise this. This is a thing that I saw in a lot of like 2000s, 2010s YA, where we would have this very kick-ass main character who's like saving the world. And at the end of it, in the epilogue, they would be like pregnant or like they've had a bunch of children and they'd become this very like domesticated person, which is fine if that's what they wanted. But I do think it makes this narrative that girls and women should only aspire at the end to achieve this like domestic ideal versus pursuing their own interests and having their own full-fledged life and it's oftentimes seen as like the happily ever after like this is the epitome of happiness and it's like but is it though like do you need kids to be happy do you need to be with the person to be happy like there are many other ways to be happy Alrighty, next up we have one that i also added in and honestly this is something that i think is so personal to me but we'll see if any of you like this so i've called this the deluded white woman character and i think basically what i mean by it is this deluded Karen character who thinks she's the main character, who thinks that she's doing all the right things, who thinks that everyone is against her, who thinks that she's on the right side of history, but really she is in the wrong. And she's put in a book and she's approached from this like satirical lens, but it's also like a very much real representation of people out there in the world who think that they are completely right and that everyone else is wrong and that they are the main character of every story. And when their bubble gets burst, it's just freaking hilarious. So let me give you a few examples of books that do this. And if you've read any of these books, then you probably know like the specific white woman character I'm referring to. And it's not that I like this character, but I like the commentary and discussion the books have through this character. So one example is Babel by R.F. Kuang. I've also got Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang, which I recently read. If you want my full thoughts on that, go watch my January wrap up because that book's coming out in May and 
it's fantastic. Another example is Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. It has a main character, POV main character, that is this deluded white woman. And then another one I really enjoyed is A Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. Again, another deluded white woman character who is just the true villain in the situation. Alrighty, next up we have a novel told across multiple generations. And I also saw someone like refer to this as generational trauma. I think that can also be like represented in a book that doesn't go across multiple generations, but it's like you see the generational trauma come through in one person's story. But I do really, really like books that tell a story, a very long saga over multiple generations. And you see the different characters in each generation and how their lives have formed from the previous generations. And this is one that I'm honestly not sure where to put because it's really satisfying, but I also want to put it under God tier because I love it so much, but I think I haven't read it in enough books to warrant it being God tier. So I'm gonna put it under satisfying. And the number one book that I can point to as one that does this really well is Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. If you haven't read that book, go check it out. It has a lot of content warnings, so be aware of that. But I think it's a book that tackles generational trauma so freaking well. And it also tells this like really heartbreaking and moving story across multiple generations that is honestly one that you won't be able to forget. It was one of my favorite books of last year and to this day I can't stop thinking about it. Alrighty, next up we have Curses slash Wishes Gone Wrong. And this one is honestly one that I find very, very satisfying. I love the idea of main characters wishing for something or wanting something and getting that, but getting it with a caveat or getting it with a twist on what they actually wanted. And so giving them consequences for wishing too much. And a book that does this really well is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. She makes a deal with the devil to live forever, but in turn, he curses her to be forgotten by everyone she meets. And so she lives this eternal life, but she's basically invisible. Next up, we have Surprise Pregnancy. This isn't one that you guys submitted, but one that I just want to talk about as one that I really don't like. I think it just throws off the story. I think it's unnecessary. And I just don't like the idea of having children making like big life decisions for people. So yeah, that's just why I don't like it. Next up we have Insta Love, and this is something that irks me so, so much because I am of the mind that I do believe in love at first meeting. Characters who are well compatible and whose personalities mesh so well from the get-go. And there's something like electric between the way that they interact, that they instantly fall in love. I think I love that, but I do not love do not love, and I'm gonna put this under overdone, situations where characters meet very briefly and they fall magically in love or can't stop thinking about someone just based off appearance or just based off a very, very minor interaction. And I'm talking so minor or like even a longer interaction that has zero substance. Alrighty, next up we have something that is very oddly specific that someone submitted and honestly, this is one that I don't really like and that's love interests using each other's last names. I don't like this at all. And actually, I'm gonna say that this is more overdone and I'll tell you why. Plenty of YA books that used to do this back in the day and I think I enjoyed it because it was so commonly done and it was also commonly done in conjunction with the whole enemies to lovers situation. And as I said before, not my favorite trope and I think it's very manufactured. And I think the idea of like characters using each other's last names, it just feels very unrealistic to me. Like I don't know anyone in real life who does that in like the way that this person is talking about, in the way that the characters like call each other by their last name to like be snarky and like bantery and whatever. The situation where I see people referred to by their last name in real life is when they have a first name that is like kind of hard to pronounce or longer, or people just prefer like their last name. It's like short or it's like really easy to say, whatever it is. And I often see this between guys actually, like they call each other by their last name because it's like the easier name. But as someone with a very long last name, which you guys don't know, but it's a very long last name. If someone, started referring to me by my last name, I would like lose it. It would be so dumb. I would honestly just laugh because it would be so weird. And I think the idea that people do this in books just like instantly turns me off because I just think it seems really childish and also strange. Okay, next up we have Marriage of Convenience. And this is one that I think I'm gonna put under neutral. I don't know how I feel about this one. And I think it's because I haven't seen a lot of books 
do this. I've seen this a lot in TV, I think. In terms of books, I don't think I've seen this all that much. And the situations where I have, I don't think I've felt very strongly about it. All right, next up we have mentor slash surrogate parent figure. And guys, this one is definitely God tier for me. I love, love, love. And I've seen this done in like both contemporary and also fantasy, but I really, really love it in fantasy. And it's a situation of like a character who has not had parent figures for most of their life or they've been robbed of them for most of their life. And they encounter a mentor or person who really helps them through their life and their journey. And they end up becoming this like surrogate parent figure for them, whether it's like a mother or father figure. And I think there's something so pure about that relationship. A few shows that do this really well are Joel from The Last of Us, also Jiraiya from Naruto. We also get this character sort of in The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang and also in The Inheritance Cycle by Christopher Paolini. There's a character like this that's done really well as well. On the note of parents, the next one we have is Mommy Energy and this is one that I actually threw in myself because there's something about this that I love and let me explain it but it is definitely like very very satisfying. So a few books that do this are Iron Widow by Sharon J. Zhao, The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang, particularly Rin's character, and then also Kaige by Vaishnavi Patel. These are characters who give mommy energy, like mommy, sorry, mommy, sorry, like they give off so much energy, so much power. They are just freaking badass and amazing. And I'm like, mommy, please tell me what to do. They are often very damaged characters. Like these characters are not perfect, but there is something about them that I'm like, yes, tell me what to do. You are the queen, you are mommy. I will do anything you say. Okay, next up we have Mutual Pining, which of course is God tier. This is like a subset of slow burn romance and it's something that gets me every time. I love characters who are pining after each other for an extended period of time. Next I have one bed trope. This is one that I honestly think is very overdone and I know a lot of people really love this one so no hate to you guys and honestly I really really love this one but I think I've seen it so so many times that these days like I'm not impressed if there's a one bed trope like I'm kind of over it. Honestly I'm kind of impressed when an author chooses not to do the one bed trope even if they have manufactured a situation where it could happen. I think it's a matter of preference like obviously tropes are there because we like them and we enjoy them so I understand that a lot of people like the one bed trope but I'm also like I would like some variety too. Next up we have complicated relationship with a parent. This one is definitely God tier for me in most cases. I think whenever this is actually thrown in, it's done very well. I and mean, I like it when it's like a major focus of like the character's journey. I especially like it in YA contemporaries and also in fantasy sci-fi and also in like literary fiction. I think the only situation where I don't really love this is like romance because I think it's just irrelevant. And also I feel like any romance book that uses like daddy issues as like the crooks of the situation bothers me. But a complicated relationship with a parent, whether it's in YA or fantasy, sci-fi, literary fiction, so beautiful. Parent-child relationships are some of the most important relationships you have in your life and seeing complicated ones on the page and how the characters are working through that or choosing to let go of that is really, really beautiful. All right, next up we have forced proximity. So this is one that I think there's two sides to. I really love forced proximity in the sense of like characters who are forced to be in a situation together and work together and have to be in like one space for an extended period of time and they have to make it work. So one book that does really well is The Roughest Draft by Austin Sigmund Broca and Emily Wiberly. The reason I like this version of forced proximity is that they are forced to be at this like summer house together to write a book together because they're like co-authors and they're doing this for the last time but they kind of hate each other right now. And that situation really worked for me because they are forced together for like a task and then it turns into this situation where like, you know, they might do something more romantically. I don't particularly like forced proximity when it's specifically done for the sake of like having the characters hook up. So yeah, that's kind of how I feel about that. I don't know if I'm explaining it well, but I'm gonna put this under neutral because I think it can go either way, but I'm not like super crazy about it either. Next we have second chance romance and guys, if I had to choose a romance trope that I love the most, this is the one. I think recently I've been reading so many amazing second chance romances and it's definitely secured it as like god tier for me. So a couple books that do this super super well are Seven Days in June by Tia Williams which involves two black writers who knew each other when they were younger for seven days in June and fell in love but were ripped apart for 
reasons beyond them and some of their mistakes and they are meeting again many years later when they are both successful writers and they are having the second chance I guess uh, at this romance and it's so freaking beautiful. So that's kind of like one type of second chance romance where like they're just getting a second chance after like being away from each other for a long time. Another one is before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan. And this involves two people who got divorced two years ago because of a lot of things going on and like a lot of grief that they were going through. And basically this book is like taking place at a point where they've reached enough healing that they can consider this again, but they're also needing to go through some more healing to get to the point where they can actually be together. And I think it was done so, so beautifully that I loved it so much. I do think there are some second chance romances that are done kind of poorly in the sense that in the first iteration of their romance, like they were very horrible to each other. And in those cases, I don't know that I would love it as much, but in these two cases that I've seen, like I loved it so freaking much. It's so beautiful. Like the level of angst, the level of healing and grief also, at like having lost this relationship before and then being able to try again, so beautiful. Alrighty, next up is one that I think is kind of a personal favorite for me, and that is Fall in Love in a Single Day. I'm gonna put this under satisfying. I've seen this done in quite a few books, and it sort of goes back to my idea of falling in love at first meeting or first meetings. This idea that like two people's personalities can mesh so beautifully and be so electric that they can like fall in love so quickly. And it's just this idea of like knowing that this person is just so right for you. A couple books that do this in like a single day format is the Sun is Also a Star by Nicola Yoon, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, and also Dash and Lily's Book of Dares. Next up we have Sisters Slash Complicated Sibling Relationships. Love this. This is definitely god tier for me. I love books that have sister relationships or complicated sibling relationships. I think it makes for some really interesting discussions. And again, I love discussions of relationships that are not just romantic. There's so many other forms of love beyond romantic love that I think are not talked about, not represented enough, and it's just so freaking beautiful. A couple books that do this really well are House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. There's three sisters in that book. And then another one I really love is Yoke by Mary H.K. Choi two sisters in that one and the relationship between them is so freaking fraught, but it's done so, so well. Next up we have Slow Burn Romance. I don't think I even have to explain this one, but this is definitely God tier for me. I love it every time, especially in like longer series, like fantasy sci-fi series where you're seeing characters interact over multiple books or work together over multiple books and you're seeing like the little crumbs of their relationship over all of these books and then you just really want them to get together by the end and then they finally do and you're like, oh my god, I've finally released all of the tension in my body from like years of waiting for this. Every interaction between these characters, like I have them tabbed in my books, like I go back to them and read them and I'm like, why can't you just be together? Next up we have Love Triangle. This is one that I think is so supremely overdone and I just want it to stop. And I think it has stopped more recently, but I do think like every now and then it comes back and I'm like, but why? And I do think there are some love triangles that have been done well out there in the sense that the main character is choosing between two different lives that she could be living if she chooses one or the other love interest. Whereas there are some where the second love interest is just thrown in for flavor or for drama just to add some spice to the main relationship going on, but they don't really like serve any other purpose. And it's just really often like this nice guy that finishes last and I feel so bad for him every time. And I just don't see why it needs to be put in there to begin with. Next up we have lovers slash friends to enemies. Oh my God. Okay, let me talk about this because this is honestly a peak trope that people don't appreciate enough. I think enemies to lovers is like the sexy one that everyone thinks is so fun. But lovers slash friends to enemies is so freaking amazing because you get characters who are romantically involved or just emotionally involved because they were just like friends before they became enemies. And you have this situation where they know so much about each other or they cared so much for each other, but their values significantly differ. And then they end up on opposite sides to become enemies. Whether it's like, you know, in a contemporary situation, but I think this is way better done in fantasy sci-fi, they're on opposite sides and now they're fighting against each other and they're using everything that they knew each other against each other. That is peak. That is amazing. That is so freaking satisfying for me. It adds this level of like angst in the situation as well. And like you kind of want them together, but then you know that like one person or the other has done terrible things and there's like no going back. And you're like, oh my God, this hurts. I like, I love it so much. A book that does this really well is the Poppy War series by R.F. Kuang. There is a couple characters in there who 
are in this situation and then end up enemies and it was so freaking satisfying. Alrighty, next up we have another really major favorite amongst romance fans and that is friends to lovers and this one is definitely god tier for me as well. I think I'm definitely the friends to lovers person over enemies to lovers. I think friends to lovers is a much more natural thing and I love the idea of like people who care so much for each other and love each other so deeply, but they don't wanna ruin that relationship that they already have, that platonic love that they already have by introducing something romantic or physical or whatever it is. A book that does this really well, in my opinion, is People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. All right, we're on the last three. So next I have tournament slash competition. This is one that I think is really fun and satisfying and I think it adds some really fun structure to a story and I think it's often done in like sci-fi fantasy. A book that does this really well is Warcross by Marie Lu. There's a whole like competition situation going on and it adds some really fun, texture to the story and you're waiting for like the next game and like what's gonna happen and how it's gonna all turn out. Next we have one that someone submitted and it's treasure hunt slash scavenger hunt. I think I feel pretty neutral about this one. I'm not like super in love with this one because I think sometimes it can get a little bit boring. I think it depends on how well the mystery of the scavenger hunt is built into it. The idea of like the mystery behind like why all this has been like hidden or kept here and all of that. Alrighty, we're on to the final trope today and this is one that someone specifically sent in. Like this is how they worded it and I loved it. It was so interesting to me and I actually really like this trope. So it's this idea of unaliving or like killing the one person in the friend group who will ruin everything. And I think this is something Something that comes up a lot in Dark Academia, obviously, and it's happened in like The Atlas Six, The Secret History, it happens in If We Were Villains by ML Rio. And I think it's such a fun trope because you're seeing characters who really care for each other and whatever else it is, but there's this like mounting obsession and frustration with the fact that this one person is gonna ruin everything and they become like this antagonist in the group and everyone else has to like sort of band together. And then it generates this sense of unease and also like distrust between the friends because they were willing to do this to one person. So what's gonna stop them from doing it to the other people in the group? And it's really fun and super dramatic and I love it. So this is definitely gonna go under satisfying for me because yeah, there's a reason I like Dark Academia books and this is one of the reasons. And with that, we have our final tiered list of all of your favorite book tropes. I feel like we've got a good variety here, but a lot of these were ones that like I really enjoy and I find really satisfying. So you guys sent in some really great ones and and I obviously also threw in some ones that I just wanted to talk about myself, but I would love to hear from all of you what you think of my tier ranking of these tropes. If there's specific ones that you disagreed with where I put it on the tiers, let me know. And if there's any tropes that I talked about or any points that I made that you really agree with, let me know. I would love to discuss all these tropes a little bit more in the comments. So leave those down below. As always, thank you guys so, so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you wanna see more videos like this one, then check out this playlist of other tier ranking videos I've done. I'll see you guys in my next video and please remember that this story ain't over. Bye!